talk about the top five ways to excel in our work it's not a sexy topic most folks don't want to talk about work (laughs) you know it's interesting i firmly believe and you can tweet this you can quote it you can put my name behind it i'll stand behind it but I, i i firmly believe that most people don't think about how they are or who they are in their work until they're trying to have fun. Let me explain. There's always that moment when you realize that whatever you're doing, whatever work you're doing, whatever money you're making, hasn't allowed for you to go to like that top tier level of pleasure, if you get where I'm going. For somebody, it happened last night at the club when they looked at the VIP menu to get a to get a bottle. And they saw the prices and they said, man, can't afford that. And for a moment, for just that moment before they drank it away, they thought to themselves, I got to do better. Like, like that, because this is when I want to be like, this is when this happens. Another time when it happens is like when you're on vacation. And you see that room, oceanfront, the guy or the gal, whoever it is, is standing off on the balcony as you walk through the beach and you go to, you think to yourself, I looked at that room. That was, it was expensive. It was so much money. And for a moment, for a moment, this is when we're like, you know, I need to get promoted or I got to do better. Like we have these, and for all of us, we have these moments like we have these moments where when we like we and I believe most of the time it comes at some point of pleasure or some at some point you see a vehicle vehicle ride past you and you go, wow. And, and, and maybe this is just how I thought about things. But I remember I would see a luxury vehicle, hundred thousand dollar vehicle, something like that ride past me. And I would go, it's a lot of money out here. <laughs> it's a lot like <laughs> It's a lot of money out here. And I would just ask myself, what are you doing to get to that point? Like, what are you doing to get to that point, Linnell? And by the way, it's not all about money. What I really want to talk about is how we maximize life. And I I think it's very clear. We had the conversation last week, the top five mistakes we make with money. I think it's very clear that part of how we maximize life is financial wisdom, period. And typically the evidence of financial wisdom is in status, things, levels, (laughs) vehicles, houses, cars, clothes, which back to last week's conversation is why. So many of us perpetuate like we are at that level, even though we're not. So I want to talk about how do we get to that level? And the only way, there's only one way. It's been that way since the beginning of time. A little bit after creation. I I don't know how long it was. But at some point after creation... We were doomed to work, (laughs) right? I don't know if it was 100 years, like if they got a chance to chill out for 100 years. (laughs) I don't know when this happened, right? But at some point, work came into the mix, all right? And this is the way that we move. We do different types of work. Go back to the story of Cain and Abel. One was a herder. One was an agriculturalist. Different types of work. How either way... Either way, we work. As a matter of fact, you will spend 
if you if you can live to the age of 76 and this is granted that you you retire between 65 and 68 you will spend 14 percent of your life working and somebody's like well i thought it would be more than that well you got to remember you know you were you were born you were a baby you you had those you had those five years where you got to play, you know, before you went to school, and then we don't count school as work. So many of us go to school for twelve years. But I always tell whenever I'm speaking to college students, I always say they'd be like, "I can't wait to get out of here," and I'm like, "Well, <laughs> well, you know, take your time, learn what you can, enjoy the process, because there's only one thing on the other side of graduation that is constant." and consistent and that is work if you're lucky a lot of people will graduate and not necessarily get to work right away or do the work that they want to do and so that's what we're going to talk about today top five ways to excel at work first thing i want to start with is not necessarily one of those top five things but is how to become a recession-proof employee or entrepreneur. Because we are 17 days into a recession. Um, and it's coming. I've been, I've been reading, I've, I've been reading the, you know, the news, and it's coming. It's interesting, too, because a lot of it's in the financial industry. So these financial firms, Coinbase... Um, mortgage brokers. Matter of fact, do you all know that two mortgage brokers this month filed for bankruptcy? Like, it was hot fourth quarter, first quarter. And this is, man, last year I think I did a show on seasons. Like, you have these, you know, you have these seasons, and you have to understand what season you're in. And understanding when you're in that spring season, when it's time to plant, when you're in that summer season, when it's time to just, by the way, even in summer, you still got to weed the garden. You still got to tend to the harvest, right, in some ways. When you're in that fall season, and and by the way, fall is like when we enjoy the harvest, and, and, and but also put some things up for winter, and then when you're in that winter season. Fourth quarter, first quarter, it's hot. Fast forward, second quarter slowdown, third quarter, beginning third quarter recession. I'm trying to figure out, y'all made all this money in the, first and, <laughs> in the fourth and first quarter. How, how do you run out of money that fast? In the, and, and by the way, we got to remember how business is done. Just filing bankruptcy is not necessarily, doesn't mean that the owner is broke. I'm thinking about the employees. I'm thinking about the employees. Because the owner's probably okay. He found bankruptcy to protect his assets. But what about the 2,000? One, one of the organizations laid off 2,000 mortgage brokers. What about them? But in terms of talking about being a recession-proof employee, there's somebody still working there. And that's what I want to talk about. Like, what what did they do and how did they navigate their work to the extent where so many people can get pink sheets and their leader, their boss, their manager says, no, no, you good. You good. We, we don't, don't want to lose you. You, you know, you, you just as good as Jim, Sally and Susan. Like we look, that's like three people. We don't want to lose you. And I'm saying, matter of fact, we're going to give you a raise. Now, if you don't think that's happening, it's happening. Um, Google it. Somebody said, what mortgage brokers filed for bankruptcy? Google it. I tell you guys, don't believe anything I say. Check it out. Check it out. But, yeah, already, too. Already, too. And there's a third that uh, is in layoffs and probably headed that way as well. I'm just giving you an example of what's happening right now in, in terms of the economy. All right, so how how does one become recession-proof as an employee and an entrepreneur? I'm going to talk about 
five ways to excel at your work, whether you're an entrepreneur or an employee. There is nothing that, you know, we Western, Western uh, taught people are connected to. Only when we put our hands to the plow mm. and love what we're doing, that's when we'll begin to come back to ourselves in our mind. Yeah. All right, man, so, that's good. Torziata, do you, let me ask you a question. Do you believe, I, do you think there's a parallel between the su- success that people have in relationship and the success they have with work? Like their their mindset with work. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's definitely holistic. Okay. And when we fail to do that, you see the results of that also as well. Yeah, you do. That's that's man. I'm happy you put that in the space. Thanks so much for the phone call. That's good. Thank you. Now. I didn't know that. The comedic symbol for love and marriage is a plow. Yes. Man, that's good. Thank you, Columbia. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, that's good. It's a plow. Now, that just that just woke something else up inside of me because I'm talking about this whole idea of excelling in the workplace, but then maybe this is more about excelling in life. Like, maybe I should have changed the title, right? Like, not just work, but excelling in life because mindset goes across the board. I was reading an article from Sherm. For those of you who don't know who Sherm is, it's a, a, a national uh, HR organization, um, Society of Human Resource Managers. And they were talking about happiness in the workplace and what they, you know, the six or five, you know, things that contribute to happiness in the workplace. And what they should have just said is your mindset is going to dictate how happy you are. And I get they had to write a whole article and, you know, it's, you know, you got to do those things, right? But as I was going through each item, it came back to not once did they say having a great manager, working for a great leader, being at a company that has a great culture. Not not one time did I see this in this whole article. So then I said, well, maybe Sherm has it wrong, right? Because surely it has to do something with my environment and the people around me and my boss. And so I started Googling and looking and researching for other articles on happiness in the workplace. And as I went through this Forbes, uh, you know, the list, I mean, I read like maybe five or six articles, right? Reading these articles on happiness in the workplace. And not one said that your happiness in the workplace has something to do with either one, the work you're doing, or the boss you have, or the people you work with, or the culture. Each one of the articles kept pointing at and they didn't say it specifically right they kept breaking it down to different things like um how you think about the work you do is one like that was one of them right um how you reposition task you don't like and i'm like mindset this is all it's all mindset it's all mindset So let me give you an example of what I mean. So I own four different businesses, very different businesses. One of the businesses, we, uh, I bring people in at about 20 to $25 an hour is what they're making, okay? And right now we're having a hard time finding workers. Like, people don't want to work. Um, and... One of the other thing I see happening is there's a lot of, like, if, if we hire a woman and another guy, like, we can see it happening. We're like, oh, man, we're going to lose both of them because they like each other, right, for the moment, <laughs> for the moment, right? And, again, I'm going somewhere with this whole mindset piece, okay? So for the moment, like, there's a, some kind of attraction because these are young people. And even to one of the brothers, I said, hey, man, don't, you know, that's going to, you don't, I'm telling you, it's going to mess with your money. It's going to mess with your peace. Just leave her alone, right? I can, "Ah, oh, boss, I ain't doing nothing. I'm like, man, it's all in your, it's all in your face and your eyes. Like, you can't even walk past her without 
his whole back curve when he walked past it. You know, it's like, just, you know, don't do it. And I'm going back to this is all about mindset and how we think about how we think about our work. Anyway, neither one is working with us right now. And that was that's a whole story in itself. I mean, she keyed his car and <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. Right. I told the brother, though. Right. <laughs> it's bad. Um, but then, of course, I, I gave her a call and a text to say, hey, um, you coming back. Oh, I can't work with him. You know, I can't work with him. And I'm like, man, so your money, you know, again, my like one and one of the things, number two, by the way, I'm just going to give it away is vision. I, I firmly believe that so many of us are caught in the present moment. The only thing that matters is the present moment. How I feel is very real. So we are constantly coddling our our current experience so then like let's go back to work so i don't enjoy work i don't enjoy the work i do and since i don't enjoy those moments it it in some ways impedes my ability to even envision what's next or impedes my ability or i just don't have or i don't know that it's not about the moment but it's about the vision it's about where I'm going. It's about where I will be. I don't know anybody who got their start in some level of work that didn't come in entry level. It's called entry level for a reason. Now, let me fast forward. Let me go back to what I was saying about. So one of the things with this one company where we're hiring people $20, $25 an hour is like we're looking for someone who can move to like an office manager position. Right. And we haven't told anybody, but we're like, man, if, if just one person can step up and really show us like the level of responsibility, their willingness to to take it to the next level, then maybe we can move them into a, a different role. Like promote them to a new level. But it seems like the majority of the people. Not everybody. Right. But the majority are so caught up in the present moment. And by this is easy work too, by the way, right? It's not hard. Um, But most of them are caught up in the moment so much so that they cut their own hours. They, oh, I can't make it or this or sleep in, sleep past a lot. Like it's like for me, it's I guess because how my wife always tells me you think different for me is mine. I can't I can't process it. Like. So where are you going? Like, are you? How is this type of work ethic going to get you where you want to be? And by the way, you talk to them, all of them want to be, I want to be where you at, boss. Like, man, hey, Mr. Harris, like, how did you, how did you do this? How how are you where you are? And it's like, mindset, vision, work ethic, but it, for some reason, it's not translating. And I'm just really... Now, somebody right now is listening to this shaking their head going, mm, that's horrible. But then let's look at ourselves in our work environment and what we do and the mindset you have about the work that you do. Like, let's, let's take a look at that. With your work, are you all in? All in. Now, I already know what somebody's thinking as I say this. Again, I told y'all this is not going to be a popular show. I already know what somebody's saying. Because, by the way, to be all in, let me let me let me tell you all how I see all in in terms of work. Okay, when I'm all in, I'm constantly thinking about how I can take this position to the next level. I'm constantly thinking how I can take the workspace to the next level. My, I'm, I mean, I'm always looking at what can be done better. Is this better? Hey, hey, boss, we need this particular piece or this part. Um, it's going to help that. You know, can I fix this over here? I see this needs, this is broken. Can I take care of that? That's what I mean about all 
in. Now, somebody right now is thinking, like, why would I go all in for, for somebody else who's paying me minimum wage? Like, they ain't, they're not even taking care of me. The reason why is because, let's go back to mindset. Mindset takes practice. It's not about your employer. It's about you. It's about training yourself to be a particular way in your work. Because if, in fact, the vision is to become an entrepreneur one day, if you train yourself to go half speed, guess what you're going to do for yourself? But what if I'm going to turn this job into a new opportunity was how you saw it? What if that's what you said? What if your, your, mind sh- your mindset completely shifted around the work that you do? And by the way, if you're a young person, like, because sometimes we're too far gone. Like some folks, it's too far gone, man. It's, it's like you've been thinking like this for the last 20 years. You're in the, <laughs> you're in that, like, you're in the, the last part of your journey worried about your retirement. And, and, and this is when, you know, like you want to go into that fourth quarter killing mentality. In the fourth quarter of my, of my work, of my life, I'm about to shift gears and make more money than I ever. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. Like you, you played yourself. You played yourself in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. You, you played yourself. I, I just don't. You have to be an anomaly. Or you're going to have to get major support, therapeutic support, coaching support, business coaching, performance coaching. Like, you're going to need some real, like, to overcome the habits that you created that you don't even see, that you aren't aware of. It's going to take a lot. And I can say that so firmly because I've had people in the twilight part of their careers call me up looking for a transformational change. And it's like, hey, man, this is a process. It's It's just not, I can't. I, you know, your mentality has been a certain way for 30, 40 years. One coaching session is not going to shift that. All right. So mindset, mindset, mindset. Now, the mind shifts. And so let's go back to Kobe Bryant as an example, like, you know, thinking about him as an example here. Because the mind shifts then there are days, like even as an entrepreneur myself, there are days where I notice like, man, I'm just not all there. I'm not all there. And so I have to regroup and in some ways gain clarity on, okay, if I'm not all there, how do I, how do I take my mentality there? And this is where vision comes in. So it's not about how I feel. Man, I'm exhausted. I didn't get as much rest as I wanted to. My sleep, my sleep isn't break down. Um, even like take this past week, man, the past two weeks have been very emotional for me and my family. And then when it's time to pivot towards work because of my mom and, and things going on with my mom's estate, you know, you name it, um, the anniversary of her death, her funeral. And Okay, so I have the conversation with my therapist. I have the conversation with my coach. I get supported. I talk to friends. But then, okay, I've done all that. Now it's time to get back to the work. How do I shift my state of being, my emotional state and my state of being when I'm emotional? Like when there's, like I'm feeling emotion, vision. It's like, okay, where am I going? What am I doing this for? I don't feel like it right now. I feel like my, my feet are in cement, but where am I, like, why am I doing this? Perfect example. I was writing an email for the Ghana trip to go out. And I'm halfway through the email, and I'm like, man, I don't feel like this. This happened this week. I don't feel like this. I just don't, I don't feel it. And then I had to remember, wait a second, man. It ain't about how you feel. <laughs> it's about transforming lives. It's about the ripple effect that happens when people experience Ghana. It's about what happens for African Americans when they come into their true identity, but it's also about being on that beach again in Elmina. And it's like when I got present to where I was going with this, 
when I got present to the vision for why, all of a sudden, brand new level of motivation. Brand new level of motivation. You don't have to like the work you do to do it well when you know why you're doing it. And why you're doing it doesn't have to be just for a paycheck or just for the boss or just for the company. What it should be is fully connected. It should be fully connected to the vision that you have for your life. Most people are not excelling with the work that they do because they lack vision. They are caught in the moment, in that moment. And as a result, they're not doing, by the way, most black folk are Christians. And then the other percentage are Muslims. And the Bible and the Quran talk about how you're supposed to work. They both talk about how you're supposed to work. And two different texts. But basically, here's the basic. And again, don't trust me. Go look it up. You're supposed to give everything, all that you have to the work that you do. 100%. The scriptures in both texts don't qualify having a good or bad boss. <laughs> the scriptures in both texts. And see, this is the thing, right? Like we, you know, you look at those things, but I think you have to go deeper and understand that these texts are about life. They're about life. The Bible's about life. The Quran is about life. And... It, all it's doing is trying to set you up to have a good life. So if you study to show yourself approved, if you put your hand to the plow and focus, there's consequences for that in life. And part of what will help you to do that is creating a vision outside of the moment for your life and for your family. Well, you know, uh, plumbing, service plumbing, and, and how they run you, uh, you know, they pay you $50 an hour to get on the horse all day and night, but they sac you sacrifice a lot of your family time. And when you're dealing with customers and of all sorts, it make you bring, it's like being a police officer, you bring a lot of that stuff home. Mm. So here's my and, and I want to I want to come back to this at the because we, we almost have breakout. But this is why I believe vision is so important, man. Like if it's just for the work, then it will impact the family. But if the work is for the family. You get where I'm going now. If the work yeah. is for the family, if this is to take my family to another level, then. And, and, and I've never been a plumber. I, 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 you know, I have done trade work where you in other yeah. people's houses. And I'll tell you, when I have done trade work in other, in other people's houses, my perspective has always been, hey, however they come in at me and whatever they say has nothing to do with me, has everything to do with them. And, and ultimately, my job is to do the best that I know how to do. Exactly. That's, and, 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 and here's the other piece. When I'm doing the best I know how to do and leveraging everything, and I, I'm going to come back to this. We've got to take a break, but I'm going to come back to this. Then that means I'm learning not just you already know what to do as a plumber, but then for your employer, if you're doing everything you know how to do and learning everything that you can, at what point do you go from employee to employer? Exactly. And that's and that's I, I think sometimes when we're going half speed, just getting by, we're missing so much education and so many. While, while, by the way, we're under fire. We're allowing that to take us down mentally again, go back to mindset to the point where we're missing an opportunity and we're missing education that will actually help us leverage. One of the things I'm going to talk about later is leverage, leverage opportunity. Because to me, if, the, if that industry is so poor, then they need some good quality 
entrepreneurs and leaders to employ individuals in their trade. So you were sharing with me that what about an industry that destroys families? Well, it doesn't destroy family. Okay. Okay. But it's like the byproduct of it. You know, it can, you know, I've watched my manager lose his family, the owner lose, and without reiterating and everything, but you see this a lot in this industry. But, but, because it's but so Al, is it safe to say that you see that a lot across the board? It might be, and it could be this pandemic is creating a lot of this stuff too. I'm, I'm in a, uh, I work for a company that does $40 million a year in electric, HVAC, and plumbing combined. Okay. This is a, a sales-driven industry. I did four hundred and fifty thousand dollars myself, one man in a van, with seventeen days of training with their program last year, Whew. and we and we still do. I'm about two twenty-five right now. Uh, and how I've much of that did industry. you see? Uh, last year, I saw a hundred grand. Okay, so you, that's not bad. I mean, twenty-five percent of uh, almost twenty-five percent of what of what? Yeah. But when when me and my wife looked at it, you know, it didn't seem like a hundred grand. Well, of course, I mean you know? taxes and and I'm I'm in the situation where the plumbing industry, as far as being a service tech, can increase my standard of living because we have like you know I'm 54 years old. I have the house that I wanted, the cars, and all the stuff that I wanted. My wife has a big business, so I'm working for the love of plumbing. Uh, I was forced back into a service truck during this pandemic. I did have a company going before then, and we are making a soft shoe transition. Of course, we can't be moving too fast because we're in a recession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm like calling in, in between this balance. And so were, uh, with... were you a, were you a plumbing before plumbing. as an entrepreneur? Yeah. As an entrepreneur. Okay. And then the pandemic put you out of business? Well, I took. A, I said, well, we can't uh, take a slowdown in business. And I know that being a uh, skilled service technician, I can just, I can still keep the money going. So, so I wasn't in a position to go six months with a uh, low pay because we were still inside the four year period, five year period of a small business. And we live, you know, of course, hand to mouth at that time, my business. Got you. So, so I had to go back in to save the house and. But uh, God has blessed us that my wife's business turned all the way up and took all the way off. Oh, that's good. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Wow. Okay. But so, here I am in the industry, uh, and it's kind of disappointing because you ran through here, you watch. Uh, they've, they've never had any black person up at this, uh, at this company uh, put these type of numbers up. And, it's, and, you know, I'm not the type of guy that's going to sit around and put a lot of numbers up. Uh, without seeing some type of commitment from the company. And so this might be the time. So let me let me tell you. So number number four on this list, right, is so you got one mindset, two vision. And I'm hoping that, you know, you're working this with the vision. Like, you know, I'm working this to achieve X. Are you in that place? Like, you know where you're going? Well, we I don't know if the, uh, the job has uh, outrolled its purpose. You know, uh, because now we're getting to the point where, uh, you know, the, the, it, the companies are charging so much that it's demanded for small business to come back in. Uh, gotcha. You know, when I have to, I charge $600 to do a sink riding. A and sink so, riding? Yeah, to ride your kitchen sink is Six $600. $600. Okay, yeah, that's... So yeah, I mean that's yeah that's opening the door to a, to a small business big time. People don't want to pay that. People, you know, some people will just say I want to get it done, right? Uh, without telling where I work at. <laughs> exactly. So so let me so. There's two things that I see potentially for you out. All right, and this this is consulting. This is not coaching. All right. I appreciate it. So don't don't even like this right here. Like this is based on you know you got to take this and and then combine it with your experience to make it work. All right, because this okay. is based on my experience and I've never been a plumber. But two things that I see that potentially for you. The first is you are working at a company that's bringing in forty million in the industry that you have a talent for. If I'm you, I'm paying attention to everything. The, the the piece of the invoices that I write up, the yep. lettering, 
the marketing, the vehicles, yep. the stickers. Hey, hey, boss, you need me to go down and get those stickers for you? Because I want to know how it's done. You know, like, <laughs> you, you get where I'm going? Yes. I mean, how did you all scale? I'm, I'm trying to get to know my manager, my manager. I, well, who's the boss? Like, I need to talk to him. I did, I did half a million last year. Why can't I have a drink with him? Because I want to know how he scaled the business, how he grew the exactly. business. Like, and so that's one, that's one angle for you, okay, in terms of where you are right now. The second angle is if they've never seen a brother like you before, that you're you're now getting into homes also that they never got into before, simply because you're a brother. That's an asset. So now, if I'm you, I'm trying to figure out how to leverage my work. Hey, and so you know, in some ways, you can if you're bringing in half a million, you're one of the top people. You can set your hours. You can say what you're going to do and what you're not going to do respectfully, right? And it's an yeah. enrollment conversation, not I'm going to tell you conversation. Hey, here's what's in it for you. Here's what's in it for me. The outcome is everybody wins. And, and that's how they treat me. That's how they treat me. Oh, that's they good. Let me, they, they let me pass and go as please. <laughs> that's that. So you got leverage. So now you got to start trying to figure out how do you work your leverage? How do you work that leverage in a way that is beneficial to you and your family and your wife? You get where I'm going? And that comes yeah. with vision. You got to know where you're going, though, Al. You got to know where you're going because that's what's going to help you. That's what's going to help you really understand where to leverage and what to leverage. You know, me not being a cricket type guy, you yeah. You know, he picked his buddies, and so I missed out on that money. You know, a weekend, Saturday all day, you, you know, it's double, it's time and a half yep. Saturday. Sunday is double time all day. Can I, can I ask you a question real quick, Gino? Sure, sure. Why weren't, why weren't you buddies with the person who was picking folks who went on weekend pay? I, again, like I said, I just, I, I just wanted, I, I wasn't trying to associate doing just enough to you know, to do what I was supposed to do. So would you would you say now, looking back, that that might have been a mistake? It is. That's my point I'm making. Too. Okay, got I'm, you. I'm trying, got you. I'm, I'm All right. talking to the, the younger folks. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. And, and and I didn't. I, the weekend, I didn't get chose for the weekend. And another thing, uh, uh, when it's time to get laid off, you know, you first I didn't catch up, you know, it, the, the foreman, you know, they're the last one to get laid off. That's after two or three months on the job. Yeah. You know, so, so again, it's about the money with me. That's, I was missing out on the money. So, yes, it was a different uh, perspective uh, that, I hadn't, <clears throat> that I hadn't considered. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, and, and so, now that, so, yeah, so I was in it for the money. So, yeah, it, 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 I should have went on. I know a couple of guys who are superintendents used to work next to me from different companies, and uh, and you know they not on the field. They still, they hire people now. You see, so uh, 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 yeah, so so they you know they accepted the position, and I teased both of them. I said, man, y'all was lazy. Y'all didn't really do no work, but mm-hmm. they had that mentality. I, <laughs> I joke with them because. They knew how to move up the move up the ladder with just with their personality. Yeah, yeah, and but, building um, relationships. Hey, Gino, well, man, this is no. you. You said something that I really want to make sure the audience gets, and and that's this: we have to build relationships with the decision makers in the workplace. Like we have to. He gave a perfect example. And then what I heard him say multiple times, and thanks for the phone call, Gino, what I heard him say multiple times is that he was only in it for the money. And I keep going back to this whole idea of vision. Like, we have to know, if, if I'm spending 13-plus years of my life working, I got to know why I'm working. Like, where am I, where am I going? What is all this for? And, and folks, it's not just for the money. Now, the money is a huge part of it. 
But for most of us, we're building out some type of lifestyle. We're building out some type of legacy if you have vision. Vision is, a, is, a, is one of the main ingredients of legacy. If you don't have vision, there will be no legacy. And so my heart is kind of breaking because I'm hearing the reality of what I, what I, what I fear we are with our work, where it's like we're just we're like going in, focused on the job, getting the paycheck, not building the relationships. And, and, and Gino said it like I'm telling I want to tell the young folks. Like, you got to have those relationships. You got to be buddy, buddy. I said it a couple of weeks ago. Matter of fact, we'll post it to Facebook, the the segment, because they did a great job of cutting out that segment. And we'll post it to Facebook and to LinkedIn. But what was it, 11 minutes you cut it down yeah. to of me talking about why social work relationships are important? Yeah. 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 We'll put that 11 minutes on Facebook later today. So you all, like... Man, mindset, number one, in terms of excelling in the workplace, mindset, number one, like you tell your, like you, you, you set the tone, you set your high happiness. Nobody does that for you. Okay. Vision number two, where are you going? Why are you working? Why are you showing up every day? It can, and, and by the way, for most of us, that vision has nothing to do with our employer and it doesn't have to for you to be successful. Then, number three is building your network, getting to know everybody that you work with, especially those in power. Like I was saying to Al, like, man, I would be, he brought in half a million. He did, like, understand. I don't, I don't necessarily know what the overhead and plumbing is, okay? So even if he was an entrepreneur and his business did half a million, 450000 he wasn't going to see all that. But I can guarantee you he's going to see more than 100000 and then here's the other reason why is because then he could write some things off, you know, that, you know, you, you push the button on expenses a little more. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you push the button on expenses like he would be having better lunches <laughs> because he's working right now. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because it's not just coming out of his pocket. It's coming out the company pot. And then he's going to write that off my whole. And so for me, I'm like, man, if they doing 40 million. I need to know the secret. So I can come out and do four, four, I can do, you know, not, not, not even, I'm not even trying to do, I just don't want to do 1%. I want to do 400,000. So I think sometimes we, we, you know, we, like, we're looking at these things, like the possibility of somebody young, like, so Al was a little older, but even Al himself saying, I just want 1%, 1% of 40 million, 400,000. I just want 1%. So how, 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 what systems do they have in place that I can put in place if I'm making, I know I'm capable. This is why I love corporate America, you all. When I saw they gave me over a $300 million budget, the responsibility that I had, I'm signing off on all the entities of the company. When I say the entities of the company, the attorneys listening know what I'm talking about, right? Because these corporations are nothing but a con- conglo- conglomeration of multiple LLCs. OK, and I would have to sign off on all the LLCs at this Fortune 500 company. And I'm looking at this like I'm learning how to set my company up. I'm like signing. This is crazy. Like, you know, and they got it bait like the state or the territory was the company. And it was so if they get sued, all you get, you know, you think you oh, I'm, I'm about to sue this big company. I'm about to get I'm going to be a millionaire. No, you're not. They, they already they already planned for you. <laughs> they already planned for you. Remember this, right? And this is also scripture. He who is faithful over little is then given the opportunity to be faithful over much. Okay? And again, we're going back to mindset. So again, this whole I, I think sometimes, and I, I really want to because a lot of us got jobs. A lot of us got jobs. We're working for other people. And I, I think one of the things that's hurting our community is this, 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 this mindset or this concept that that's theirs. And so I'm just going to do what I got to do. Part of how we learn to build, part of how we learn entrepreneurship, part of how we learn to lead is taking ownership. 
the best place to practice ownership is when you don't own because you get to make mistakes. When I was in corporate America as a leader and I was leading a division or managing a team, I, I took ownership of that. Do you think I made mistakes, Anita? Uh, I, I don't know. Did you? Yes, ma'am. Did you make I'm me? fallible. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, I made mistakes. I made mistakes, but guess what? I made mistakes on their dime where now as an entrepreneur, I have those lessons under my belt where I don't make those mistakes anymore. Now, here's the thing. You can't work leverage you don't have. And so if, and and this is for employees and entrepreneurs, you cannot work leverage that you don't have. You can't work leverage you don't have in a relationship, right? There's a certain amount of leverage I have with my wife due to the trust she has for me, due to my, my track record with her, due to, you know, you know, you name it, the thing, like my consistency, there's a certain level of leverage I have in my relationship with my wife. There's a certain level of leverage I have in my relationships with, with my friends. I would say even with people that work for me. I mean, I've been out of town, and I day, you know, typically I, we, how we work things out, I pay them every Sunday, right? I'm out of town. I day don't be like, yo, 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 what my pay? What my pay? What my pay? Right. And I'll be like, oh, man, I forgot to pay our day. Right. Because we, we do it on Sundays. I'm just giving you all a real life. This is a real life scenario. Our day's in the studio. He'll tell you. Our day, do I have leverage with you in terms of paying you? Yes. OK. Why, why do I have leverage with you in terms of paying you? We have a good work relationship. Have I never not paid you? No. No. I, I always pay you what, what, what I owe you. Yes. That creates leverage. You all get this? So if I ask I day to then, like, hey, I need you to double your hours, he's not going to be like, am I going to get paid? It's not even on his mind. That's leverage, you all. Many of us, so, and by the way, many of us have this leverage. We don't know how to work it. Then some of us, we don't have this leverage, and we try to work it. Here's how you gain leverage. Why are you valuable? What is your value proposition? At the job, as an entrepreneur, like can you clearly articulate it? What is it that you bring as an entrepreneur, as a business to the space? What is it that you bring as an employee to your employer? What is your boss saying about you in the talent reviews? What, like, what, what level of value? One of the things I see way too often is many of us trying to leverage what we don't have in the workplace and then being mad. You see these, I see these reels about folks who be like, yeah, I asked for PTO, and then they already, they already at the vacation spot when they put in the request. And it's kind of like, it's funny, but that tells me, like, you don't have an important job. If <laughs> you're doing that, I don't care how posh the hotel is that you that, that you, you 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 chose to stand in front of, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't you don't have an important job if you're doing that, and anybody who is important to the job can leverage their time. There was a time I took a whole month off. How was that possible? I leveraged it. I enrolled them in it. This is what's best for me, and it's best for you too. But I also was bringing high value to the organization. Now we normally we can't let people do that. I, I get that. But here's what I bring. And here's what I will bring in August, September, because I took a whole month off in July. It was July 2010. I still remember. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I went to Hawaii. Then I went to South Africa. That's what happened. But I set it up. I, le- I leveraged. I had been... I was killing the game. So I'm like, hey, like early in the year, I want to take July off. I want to take the two first weeks, and I'll come back for, you know, take care of anything in one week that might be missing, and I'm headed to South Africa after that. 
And I laid it all out. This is exactly how I wanted to play it out. My point is, we look at these things. So I think it, it gets us, you know, we look at the job, we look at work, it's like, ah. Oh. You know, it, it, and it's like, man, there's an, there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity there. It's the same opportunity that has existed for all time. And it is to build yourself and, le- and, and create something that is specific to you. Now, you guys know I'm all about purpose. I'm all about purpose. And one of the, one of the key ways to eliminate this, this whole thing of doing work you don't like is to be fully aligned with your purpose. I haven't talked much about purpose today because I'm also very clear that many of us aren't doing work aligned with our purpose. And it takes like, it, it takes this one-on-one conversation around work to get us there. All right, here's the last but most important part of excelling in the workplace, you guys. And as an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs really listen to this part, but it's important for employees as well. You have to know your worth. This goes both ways. Because most of the time when, when people say know your worth, we think, oh, I'm worthy. Right. But now we're talking about in the workplace. I'm going to be very real about this. If I'm working somewhere and I know I'm not bringing value. I should be preparing for my next steps. Like I know that in term, not in terms of my intrinsic worth as a human being, but in corporate America, what they call it is human capital. In terms of my position as human capital. And the role that I play today is not valuable to the organization. They have a computer doing half the work I do now, right? Like you, like this, we have to, you have to be first, not second, not third to the conversation around what's happening with the work that you do. You have to be first. Man, it had to be proposed to my wife in 2013. So 2013, I remember we were in Paris. We walked into a McDonald's, and there was a kiosk. That was new back then, right? There was a kiosk to take, you know, you, and you go up to the kiosk and take your order. And this was in a Parisian McDonald's. And I told my wife, I was like, ooh, you see this? I'm like, wow. And we got some croissants and coffee at this McDonald's, okay? Because McDonald's knows how to do it in different. They do it different in different countries. They're like, y'all eat croissants here? We're going to sell croissants. So we had croissants and coffee in this McDonald's. You did it all on a kiosk. Put your whole order in. I came back and did a radio show and talked about this. And I was like, hey, (laughs) this is coming. For those of us who are cashiers and things like that in grocery stores, matter of fact, this is is crazy, you all. I, I really want you all to hear what I'm saying right now. When I was... 17, 16, 17, I was a cashier at Jules Osco. I worked my way up from bagging. They called it a service clerk. I was a service clerk. I pushed in carts and I bagged groceries. It was a nice title. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And I got promoted to cashier. Guess how? Guess how? Because I bagged the hell out of them groceries. And I pushed the hell out of them carts. All right, I, I'm, I'm just being serious right now, okay? Like, that's how. Hey, Linnell, can you run it? Yep, I got you. Boom. Quick, and I was back to, like, I did it fast. I went out there. Uh, I don't want to bang you. I mean, I went, got as many in as fast as possible, then back out. Get them lines down with these bags. Help the cashiers out. Next thing I know, they were like, hey, you want to be a cashier? Now, here's where I'm going here. As a cashier... I remember I was making about twelve or thirteen dollars an hour, and minimum wage back then was like eight. I was sixteen or seventeen where I began to learn. By the way, my, this, thank God for my father. He put this work ethic in me. He was always the one who was like, "Man, if you do it, go all the way. Don't if you're gonna be there at Jules for six hours, do six hours of work. It will pay off." He wasn't lying. Because then that got me to the warehouse where I was making $16 an hour. 
Same thing there. And I, I learned this very early on in my work, labor work. So then when I got to work where it was data analysis and stuff like that, I don't got to, I'm not sweating. Are you kidding me? Boss asked for one, hey, can you analyze this? I didn't just analyze that. I was like, and by the way, while I was analyzing this, I saw these two trends, and so I built the analysis out on that too. Man, let me know think. You know, they do that double take. Be different. This is part of how I grew in the corporate space. Now, here's what I was going to say. I was making $16 an hour. It's hard to believe that minimum wage is 15 and people are still making that. And inflation is what it is. Young people, there are a lot of young people right now who feel like work is optional because you're at home with your parents. I'm telling you, if you look at work when you are strong, like, right, this is when you're strong. If you look at work as optional and you're not maximizing, you're not maximizing your earning potential, it's going to catch up. It's going to catch up because I'm just thinking about this. I was making $16 an hour, and there are people I know who are making the same thing then and the same thing now. So, you know, Linnell is, you know, he's pushing it for the employers today. I'm pushing it for you. I'm pushing it for you. Here's the other piece about knowing your worth. So we talked about it on the downside, right? Folks, we got to be honest. Am I doing work? Am I doing work that matters? This is what I mean by knowing your worth in the workplace. Am I doing work that matters? And if I'm not, how do I position myself to do work that matters? And then once I begin doing work that matters, doing everything I can to bring value to that position So then that way I can go back to number four, gain leverage, but then also dictate what's next in my career. Let me say it again. I did not go from entry level to vice president and officer of a company because they wanted to promote me so badly. That's not why. I went, from vice, I went from entry level to vice president and officer of a company because my father did a good job helping me with my work mindset and work ethic. I had a vision for where I wanted to be in my life. I was so clear about where I wanted to be in my life. I networked with the right people. I didn't care. The boss was having something at her house. I was there. I bought a bottle of wine. Hey, uh, hey. They can be like, you went to that? Can't stand her. Like, I can't either. <laughs> but I need her network. You know what I mean? Because guess who else was there? All her peers, her boss. So now I can finally talk to the VP at the barbecue. You know what I'm saying? You wouldn't let me in at the job. But now they're like, oh, Linnell's a really nice young man. Hey, I'm just, they, oh, I'm too, I'm not giving my weekend to them. You better if you want to go somewhere. So network. Then number four, leveraging, like knowing how to leverage. So now if I'm doing great work and I have great relationships, now I know how to leverage those things in the workplace. They call it the corporate game for a reason. It's a game. A lot of times we as a community get we. We get told we're playing checkers while everybody else plays chess. And I want you to understand that this is this conversation is how to play chess. This conversation is how to play chess in the workplace. Man, man, I'm gonna go back to I'm gonna go back to Al. Somebody probably thought I was tripping when I said, hey man, they need to buy stickers for the vehicles. Volunteer. Man, that's chess that's chess you all i didn't leave corporate america in 2015 and magically become a successful entrepreneur i spent 16 years in corporate america playing chess 
I wanted to understand how things worked, how they made money, what it looked like, how they leveraged money, how they leveraged credit. I would ask questions like, so how, you know, so how does my, my, uh, my credit line work? You know, because they, you know, they give you a credit card when you get to a certain level in corporate America, right? And I'm like, so how does this work? Um, if I pay it at this time, they know, where did the company get the credit from? I was asking because, I, hey, I knew. Like, one day I'm going to be an entrepreneur. My vision was to leave corporate America by the age of 45 and run my own companies. So it was like, so I need to know so when I'm an entrepreneur, I can do the same things. So because I had my vision, go back to, you know, number two in the ways that I've shared today, then before I even left corporate America, I was building my business credit. For all of you who have W-2s, you want to listen to this. All right, my entrepreneurs, next week, we're going to go all in on entrepreneurship. But for all of y'all who have W-2s, hear me out when I say this. Hear me out when I say this. You're going to share this part and, and let them know. Listen to the last 10 minutes. If, if you don't have your own business, you are losing a lot, a whole lot of money. All my people who are employees, if you don't have a side business, you are losing so much money. Let me tell you how. This is just queuing up the entrepreneurship show. That's all I'm doing. All right. Let me tell you how. Because if you have a W-2, Uncle Sam loves you. And the reason Uncle Sam loves you is because you don't have any write-offs. You have no write-offs, which means even if you make $30,000 a year, he gets all the taxes that's coming to him for $30,000 a year. If you make $50,000 a year, Uncle Sam loves you if you have a W-2 and you don't have a side hustle because he gets all the taxes coming to him that's due him from that $50,000. If you make $100,000 a year, Uncle Sam has a very special love for you because you're in a different tax bracket. And if all you have is a W-2, and you don't have a side hustle, side business, multi-level marketing. So, hey, people, like some folks, six-figure folks, you come to them about multi multi-level marketing. I'm a director of operations. I, I, uh, I'm too busy in my job for that. Hey, just chuckle when you walk away because Uncle Sam loves them. Uncle Sam hearts them because he's getting an extra chunk of change off them in that W-2, right? Everybody should be an entrepreneur. <laughs> and if you're not, now let me say this to end the show. Years ago, I was vice president at this point. I was vice president at this point. Years ago, I'm sitting around in the boardroom with my peers, EVPs, SVPs, these folks making. And just to be like my bonus, let's put it like my bonus was more than what people make in a year when I was in corporate America. OK. And when I say more than what people people make, you take the median income and multiply it by three. My bonus would be about that. Now, mind you. When it came in, you only saw about 56% of it because Uncle Sam was like, thank you, <laughs> right? <laughs> thank you. Now, here's how I got it back. Here's how I got it back. For all my folks with W-2s who, like, you know, I don't have time for that. You know, you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> you come with me, you know, talking about some Amway stuff. Get out of my face. You know, Melaleuca or, you know, any of these, any of these, you know, companies, right? You want to you know, know the reason? I'll, I'll share this with my, goal, my Slayer Goals member. You want to know the reason somebody come with me in multi-level marketing? And I'm like, and tell me more. It's because even now as an entrepreneur, I'm always looking for more write-offs. Here's, I'm sitting at 
in the boardroom and all my peers complaining. It was like March, April. Everybody getting ready to pay their taxes. And by the way, you get to that level, either you're going to let them take it all up front, and it's a lot, or you're queuing it up and trying to figure out how much you can write off, and then you're paying what's left, right? And it's to the tune typically of five figures. Like So folks at that level paying five figures in taxes, easy. 10000 20000 30000 47000 I mean, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in taxes. Even more, all right? So they all sitting there. They're complaining about their taxes. And I'm listening to them going around the room like, oh, man, I had to pay this much, blah. I was the only one that was quiet because I was making just as much money as them, but I was getting a return. You want to know how? Because I had LLCs set up. I had businesses set up. Even my drive to work was tax deductible. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me. Like, I'm queuing this up for next week. Even my drive to work was tax deductible. You want to know why? Because I had a P.O. box next to the job where all the mail for my business went. And I had to check the mailbox. Hey, man. I, I, hey, I'm here because I love you. I share this because I, we leaving so much on the table. We're leaving so much on the table because we don't have the knowledge. So, while, while I was bringing everything I had to the workplace, I also was building outside. Because guess what? You weren't going to catch me with a pink slip. <laughs> no, sir. I promise you, I promise you, I was just going to bounce right into the next hustle. And this is where we got to be. And by the way, I didn't say I gave them 40%, 50, I gave them 100% while I built outside and leveraged what I was building outside to save on my taxes and my W-2. I might bring my accountant next week. I might just be like, yo, come on the show. We'll see. But that's what we're going to talk about next week. Entrepreneurship and why every last one of you should have an LLC. And I'm not just saying go jump on CyberDrive. You need to reach out, especially if you got a job. Reach out to your attorney. Get it set up properly. Get it set up in a trust. Like when you're making, when you're making money, this is the time to build. This is what you should be spending your money on. Folks get that bonus. Somebody said they tax 40%. They'll take the other 60%. Like, I deserve this. They're going to shop and spree. No, what you should be doing is starting another LLC, calling your attorney, updating the trust, asking about family limited partnerships, figuring out how to protect everything with taxes, investing in real estate, you name it, all of that is how you leverage a W-2. That's free game. That's free game just for listening. I love you guys. I really do. Hey, my inspired peoples. Linnell Harris here, certified ontological coach and trainer. I'm so excited that you're watching the channel. By the way, did you know you can catch the show live at 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. every Sunday morning? You can. All you have to do is go to my Facebook stream, Coach Linnell Harris, catch the stream live, or you can listen to the radio show via iHeart at WVON 1690 AM. But since you're here, if you love the content, I ask that you share it, like this particular video, and subscribe to the channel. I hope you're having a great day.